this. Hello. Hi, guys. My name is uh, Ragnar. I'm obviously made in Norway. Um, I I'm supposedly here to talk about the secrets of game, develop game development, but that's because I didn't really submit the title for my talk in time to be included in the uh, printed uh, book. So I know some of you may have come to find out what the secrets of game development are. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really have the answers. I really like this tweet I saw yesterday um, by John Lamam. How do video games ever get made? Oh, child, no one knows or can ever know. They're one of life's great mysteries. And this is true. Uh, I've been doing this for 25 years, and I have no idea how we actually manage to develop, complete, and ship games. Every release takes me by complete surprise. I never see it coming. But it's always amazing when we actually release a game. So yeah, I'm not here to talk about the secrets of game development. I am here to talk about... Uh, Something I like to call the box, or building games to fit your studio. Um, this is the boring description of what I'm going what to talk about. A practical process-oriented approach to game design, project management, and scope control. And if you get up and leave now, I will not blame you. That sounds very, very dry and dull. It's not going to be, and it shouldn't be. It's fun to make games. I mean, it's a business, we're professionals, but it's, it's fun. Making games is amazing, chaotic, creative, inspiring, exhausting process, and one I care deeply about. It's like building Rome with crayons in a day. It's, I'm, I'm really lucky to be doing this, and so are you guys, so let's try again. So this is what I'll be talking about telling my story, our story, and perhaps inspiring game creators, you guys, to create even better games. And not just stuff about process. I will try to be inspirational or aspirational. Um, and I'm not going to really talk much about the actual process, um, but about the story and philosophy behind processes and how can they can help you create and how they help us create. It's also a story about toilet paper. Uh, I, uh, it will make sense. Um, and it's about the box and about an inexperienced studio. It's about fumbling in the dark and getting better at what we do. Um, but I'll start off with who I am because I'm sure uh, a lot of you don't know me. That's my Simpsons self. A few years ago, everybody had like a Simpsons avatar, so I did that, and I never really moved beyond it, so still have that. Um, I am creative director at Red Thread Games in Oslo, Norway. Um, before that, I worked at a company called Funcom, also in Oslo. I have been making games for 25 years, uh, working on projects of different sizes from 10 people to 300 people, uh, together with many different publishers. Um, but I wanted to learn a little bit about the people here, because this is my first time. Uh, and I have no idea what, what kind of audience I'm talking to. So how many people here are developers? Raise a hand. OK, so most of you. Uh, press? All right, a few. And just players or people who like are peripheral to the game industry? Yeah, some? OK, good. Mostly devs then. Um, so who's, among the developers, who's working in a studio with 10 people or less? And with more than 10 people? Okay, so it's a good mix here as well. And lastly, uh, mobile games? And PC console games? Okay, cool. Now I know. Um, hopefully there's something in this talk for all you guys. So. If you're not into massively multiplayer online games, these are probably the games that you would know that I've worked on. Uh, I'm probably best known for working on The Longest Journey and Dreamfall series of adventure games, uh, starting with a point-and-click game to the left and moving on to Dreamfall Chapters, which is like an open-world 3D adventure that came out, uh, well, the final episode came out last year. 
I love these games and I love our fans. This is some of the fan art we have from the longest journey in Dreamfall games. I really enjoyed being part of that community and, and seeing the reaction to the games we've made for the last you know, 18 years now. Um, we have the best fans. So five years ago, I left the big studio to uh, start something tiny and new together with a few ex-colleagues and good friends and even family. And it was the first time I had total freedom, full responsibility, and it changed the way I thought about games and made games. It made me think more about process and constraints and also about how much fucking work it is to run a studio and to make games and take care of everything. Uh, left me five years ago, true story. On the right side, that's me today. It takes its toll. That's not actually me, but I haven't changed that much. So by the time I started Red Thread Games, I'd been making games for almost 20 years, but I never really had to pay anyone's salary. That happened you know, outside my scope. I never had to worry about operational budgets or that there is toilet paper in the, the bathroom. I'll get back to that. Uh, there's a lot of new things that you had to learn going from just making games into running a studio. So the question I had to ask myself, and that's sort of the question I'm trying to answer today. This is the problem, this is the hypothesis that we're going to try to solve here. How to make the right decisions and ship a great game with the resources you have without crashing and burning. With the resources you have, and that's the important thing too. Because I went from working on a game called The Secret World, which had a team of 300 people, to running a company with 10 people and have to make a game. And of course, scope changes and you have to reevaluate everything you do. So, three takeaways today. The process is the product. Limitations encourage creativity and plans are worthless. Planning is everything. Um, I'll go into more detail about these things. But importantly, the journey, development is the destination. The development is the game. We don't want to run blindly towards the distant idea of this product, this game you envisioned in your head, and do everything you can to make that thing come into existence, because that's not game development. A game emerges over time. It's a product of everything you do, all the decisions you make. I will get more into that, but we use processes to let the game emerge and evolve over time. And secondly, limitations encourage and inspire creativity something we call conditional design, and it's also really important to us. And again, I'll describe this in more detail. And the third, keep your plans and your designs dynamic. Change is good, change is healthy. Making design decisions conditionally based on where you are and what you can see on the screen is important. All these things are connected. That last one actually comes from uh, Ike, the 34th president. He yeah, is the one who said, supposedly, plans are worthless, planning is everything. Uh, because you can plan for things, you can plan to make an emergency, uh, but until the emergency happens, you have no way to deal with it. Like the previous speaker said, game development is R&D. You never really know what's going to happen. So you can keep planning, and you should keep planning, but you should also be ready to throw plans away and change what you're doing. So in essence, game development is war and many lives are lost. So going back to the three things we're going to talk about, process and how product, uh, product focused development is different from process, how constraints can be awesome, and how about flu being fluid is, is more important than being rigid. It trumps rigid. And we'll talk about this in context of the box. The box is a closed and rigid shape. It has constraints, it has limitations. A box contains a quantity of something. And you can fill a box with anything you want. And in our case, the stuff inside the box is the game and all the work that goes into making a game. The box sets clear conditions on us as creator. This defines conditional design, and conditions require processes. 
but the box doesn't care what it contains. It, its contents are fluid. So you need to fill it with what you want to create with your ideas and your passion, and that has to come from you. So this approach that we're talking about, uh, designing to the box, designing within the box, it is about enabling passion and creativity through limitations and not artificially throttling it. I'm going to take a, a major detour. Whenever I use the word major detour, I, 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 this just pops into my head. So, who am I and why do I think I have something to say about, about all of this? And I'm sure there are a lot of people here with more experience than me, uh, who ship bigger and better games than me and who had more success than me. Uh, but on my side, I have, I've been doing this for a very long time, and I have had a lot of failures and some successes, and I'm starting to figure out how to avoid the former and at least have a chance at the latter. So that's why I'm here, and that's what I'm saying, what I'm saying. Also, I really want to see this movie. I would see a movie called Major Detour. So this is me. I don't fish anymore. I do like fishing minigames, though, so there's that. Um, I was always a storyteller. I, it's, it was my greatest joy, uh, writing stories, drawing stories, uh, telling stories to an audience. I remember when I was a kid, at, when my, our parents had parties, I would take the kids into the basement and tell them horror stories, and they wouldn't sleep at night, and my parents were told that I had to stop doing that. So I really enjoyed telling stories. I drew comic books, I made movies, I wrote short stories, I wrote the first chapters to many, many, many books when I was a kid. Um, and then I got a hold of a computer and I had to teach myself to program a computer in order to get to play games because my parents didn't want to give me any games, so I made maybe a hundred games between the ages of 11, 12 and 15, 16. Uh, I wanted to play and I wanted to see how stories could be told interactively, so I had to create. There's a lesson in there somewhere. Um, then I moved over to mostly playing other people's games once I actually got a computer where I could go to friends' houses and borrow their games. And I discovered adventure games, and this is Zork. I never actually managed to finish Zork. It was incredibly difficult, uh, but it really fascinated me. So I started making my own adventure games. Um, first through very basic self-made engines. I remember one of my first adventure games, whenever you picked up an item, it remained in the world because I had no idea how to actually remove an item from the world, so you could just pick it up endlessly. And then I started using third-party tools, like this one called The Quill for Commodore 64. And I made a game called Peasant's Quest and also Peasant's Quest 2 both lost to the ages when my parents sold my Commodore 64 and all the discs, unfortunately. But I'm sure it was awesome. And I kept creating and, kept, kept creating and playing adventure games um, until I stopped. Because games didn't really do what I wanted them to do at this point. And keep in mind, this was the late 80s. They weren't visual enough. They didn't really have the aesthetics I wanted in order to tell cool stories. And I wanted to make movies. So I left for New York. I went to film school, um, learned how to write, direct, shoot, edit films. And I figured this is what I was going to do. Making films is fantastic. You get to tell a story visually with beautiful music and sound. And yeah, so much better than games. But then I started working on a game, actually, one of the first CD, well, at least the first batch of CD-ROM games. I am really old. And this was in the early 90s. Um, this game was actually called The Snow Arrow. It never came out. Um, it was very pretty. But that's when I realized that there's so much you could do once you had this technology. You had the storage space. You had the fidelity of the music. You had this beautiful art. And that's when I figured, yeah, making games, telling stories in games. That is actually something that is worthwhile. This could be a really interesting medium to get back into. So I returned to Norway, got a job as a producer with Funcom, got assigned to 
make a game called Casper based on the movie. Uh, one week later, I was in Hollywood meeting with the producer and director, making some awful fashion choices. This was the 90s. Just please forgive me. Um, so the game I was working on was an adaptation of this movie. You may not remember it because you're probably, most of you are too young to, to remember this movie, but, and also because you probably had good taste, it was not a great movie. But all we had to start with was basically a screenplay, and that was it, and a 12 month uh, production time. So together with a team of, I think about six people, we made a game for PlayStation, Sega Saturn, 3DO. There was even a, a Game Boy Color version, although we didn't develop that. And in this game, you played a ghost, and because of my inexperience with making games and figuring out how to design them, the ghost in the game could not fly through walls. That was impossible. I had no idea how to, how to make a game out of that. So in this game, Casper, you know, he was a really terrible ghost who could not fly through walls. Like I said, we were thrown right into development on, on completely new and unknown platforms. I remember we had the PlayStation 1 dev kit, but we did not have an instruction manual in English. We had one in Japanese, nobody spoke Japanese. So we just had to try to figure it out. Luckily, we had good programmers, but we had to make our own engine. We had to solve every single technical problem just based on you know, sitting and putting things into the PlayStation and seeing what was coming out. Unity was 20 years away. Things are so much easier now. So after Casper, which is still my best-selling game, this, that's, it's all been downhill from there on, I went on to work on a bunch of games at Funcom, including these games. Um, I helped create three game franchises. Um, Anarchy Online, Longest Journey, Dreamfall and The Secret World. And the cool thing about working at Funcom is we had total freedom. Like I said, I didn't have to worry about people getting their salaries. All I had to worry about was make sure the team had direction, that we were doing the right things, that we were creating good games. Development was run by the people making games, not by marketing departments. And it was, it was a really great experience. And this led to Basically, the longest journey coming into existence. Um, the longest journey was a game that was had a massive design document from the beginning, but it didn't really have any budgets or estimates. Uh, we had a timeline. I think we we doubled that. I think the game was supposed to be done in 18 months. We spent three years on it, and the process of making this game just happened. It wasn't intended. It wasn't based on any kind of experience. It was just like. Here is the game, here is the game we saw then we envisioned, and we tried to make it. But given the fact that we had a very flexible timeline, we changed things, we tossed things out. We didn't have an ending to the game until uh, maybe like six months before release. Less than that, actually. And that was a good thing. It really helped us sort of along the way figure out what made the game good. We were able to throw things away, we were able to iterate and experience. On the plus side, we made a pretty good game. On the minus side, it cost twice as much as it was supposed to and came out at least a year late. Happily, it sold really well, so we got to continue making games. So in 2012, um, I finished my last game at Funcom. This game, The Secret World, I'd worked on for over five years. I actually pitched the original idea in 2003 or 2004, so the game had been in my head for more than almost a decade at that point. It had a massive team. I think the production team was 200, and in addition we had uh, QA and uh, all of those things, so over 300 people in total worked on the game. Enormous budget. Uh, the game didn't do well enough to justify that budget. I love it, but you know, MMOs are tough and we made some bad choices along the way. So Funcom had to lay off a bunch of people and I decided this was a good time to leave and start a new studio. And this was pretty much exactly five years ago today. So we got a grant 
to start up from the Norwegian government because the Norwegian government does support game development, which is great. And then we went straight on Kickstarter to make a sequel, another sequel to The Longest Journey and to Dreamfall called Dreamfall Chapters. And we were able to raise $1.5 million on Kickstarter, which allowed us to begin, uh, begin full production in May of 2013. So we put together a team. At that point, I think we were about 10 to 12 people plus uh, some outsourcing. And we started working on an ambitious 10-hour 3D adventure. Again, we had sort of the, the idea of the game we were going to make the product. We had that pretty much set in stone. We had promised that on Kickstarter. We had sort of already defined what this game was going to be. And like I said, until we started Retro Games, I had never released a game on time and on budget because we usually had the luxury of spending more time and money uh, where I had been. So one year into production on Dreamfall Chapters, we realized we were getting stuck. We were making a product, something that was set in stone. And we didn't th have time to think about how we were making the game. We had production processes, tasks, timelines, but we weren't driven by process. We were driven by this idea of the product, the final game. So we stopped about a year into development. We re-evaluated re everything we had done. And we changed how we were working and how we were planning to release the game. We went episodic instead, spreading our releases out. Uh, rather than having one big release, we spread them out over the next uh, 18 months. Um, and we pulled through. We completed all five episodes. Uh, book five came out in June of last year, so almost a year and a half now. And the game kept selling well enough for us to sustain on the income of that. Uh, we made a game that was, instead of being a quite sort of focused 10 hour game, we made a 30 hour single player game uh, with a ton of content in it. Um, so it ended up being much bigger and much more expensive and more ambitious than we had planned. But on the good side, this was an evolution that happened over time. Instead of again focusing on, on just that's our end goal. We were able to be more dynamic, to keep changing, to keep planning and changing our plans along the way. Um, after we released the final episode, we jumped right into a complete version of the game for consoles. And then finally, a what we call the final cut on PC that released in July of this year. That's actually a free upgrade to everyone who'd already purchased the game, which is terrible for business, but you know, it made sense to us. We had had fans who'd been waiting a long time and wanted to make a version that we could be proud of and that was going to stand the test of time. And I'll show you guys a little trailer for that uh, final cut of the game.
So Dreamful Chapters, it's a game that looks uh, a lot more expensive than what it was. It was made by a tiny team, and the reason we were able to actually do that over time was because we learned sort of the three pillars of how we wanted to, to develop games and operate our studio, and we get back to this for a minute. Uh, process, constraints, and fluidity. Um, through development, Dreamfall benefited from all the three. We were able to iterate our processes because of the episodic release model. The fact that we had five separate launches instead of one allowed us to basically change and iterate the way we were working. Between every episode release, we were able to look at the plans ahead and look at what we're going to make and change depending on the previous three to four months. We also had very clear constraints that helped us focus on what was important. Uh, and the constraint was that we had to deliver a new episode. We couldn't stop. We had to keep telling the story. But we kept our plans and our designs as fluid as possible so we could change that between every release. So even though we knew the story and we sort of knew what we had to release, we were also able to sit down with blank sheets after every release and see, okay, who, what worked and what didn't. And again, to iterate on all those processes. And never defining things too rigidly past the next episode's release. And our constraints were basically time, budget, um, of course, the story, and the people we had to, to work on it. And this was our box. This was the box we had to work within. And we never left that box, but within that box, we were able to keep improving and doing better and better stuff. And that's sort of when that idea came that you know, this is the right way to make games. This is the way to sort of constrain yourself in order to help you be more creative, more productive, and actually deliver something. I'm going to take a minor detour from my major detour. And uh, since we were talking about Dreamfall chapters, um, parts of the game actually take place inside a mega city that covers most of Central Europe called Europolis. And the neighborhood you play in uh, is actually Prague. Um, it's a neighborhood we call Propast in the game. We did a lot of research on this through Google. And I think the results speak for themselves. I, this is my first time in Prague and walking around last night. Yep, this is exactly what the city looks like. I think we completely nailed it. Um, I'm kidding. But I mean, the game takes place 200 years from now. So I, it is possible that Prague is going to look like this. We really should have come and visited, but yeah. We had talking trash cans that spoke in Czech, so I mean, I think that's, that's fine. That we, that's, yeah. So back to, the, back to our major detour. That still works. Um, so this is our team now. We are 20 people at Retro Games, and we plan to keep growing. I'll show you a video of our studio. Unfortunately, it's more than a year old, so it doesn't really show uh, all the people we have now, but it shows a little bit of what our studio looks like and what we're working on.
so games with soul is what we sort of aim to make that is our goal that's our our vision for the games we we are making and like most of you we are constrained by resources money of course and time we have a thousand ideas and how do we transform these ideas into into games that's always the challenge and that led to the idea of the box and now we're left the detour and we're back on the main track and here they are again just a reminder and now I'm going to talk a little bit more about what this means specifically for us so our process when it comes to designing games we are focusing on process oriented design versus product driven design and here the difference is that process oriented means instead of again being anchored to the idea of what the game is going to be you let the game evolve over time you preserve your vision your core vision of the game through the process of working in the different phases of the game from idea creation through development to release and the product is born of the process rather than the other way around again we try not to be too stuck with the game that we have envisioned and that's not going to be finished until two three years from now because again this is about research and development this is about finding the game through working also as a team on the game and process is fantastic it's discovery improvement it's iterating on what you have on the screen and carving the unique gems of gameplay out of rough crystal process is development There's a really great book that I can really recommend everybody read. It's called 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School, and it's mostly about architecture. And I know we're not architects, we're not building architecture, but there are a lot of similarities. And a lot of great literature when it comes to game development is not about game development specifically. Actually, there are m most books about game design are quite poor. Uh, it's a good idea to look elsewhere and be inspired by by other art and production processes. So in this book, there is one page that talks about being process driven or process oriented. And here they sort of state some, some points that I think are, are, are really key and can really be helpful in, in game development. Making design decisions conditionally with the awareness that they may or may not work as you continue towards the final solution. Knowing when to change and when to stick with previous decisions and accepting as normal the anxiety that comes from not knowing what to do. Again, this all goes towards the process, the iterative process of making games. So the product is what, and the process is how. And game development is about redefining or defining the what through the how. And this box we're, not, we're talking about is really not about rigidity. It is about setting boundaries and designing within that. Being process-oriented is about being flexible, but responding well to emergencies and changes along the way, and being able to make the right choices continuously. And everything in game development is a process. Idea creation is a process in a forum. You know, the best ideas come from discussing them with others. Same goes for design. Prototyping is, is a process. Every single aspect of game development can be looked at as a separate process, that all of it, again, combines into defining and making the product, making the game. But let's not mistake process for content. Obviously not, but process leads to content. And process is about defining limitations, designing, iterate, then iterating and implementing within those constraints, building a framework and then building the box. Constraints are basically a tool for us, and the box defines those constraints. I'm going to reference something else called the Conditional Design Manifesto. This is not a book, this is a design manifesto that you guys can look up. Not exactly sure who came up with this, and I have to say that I don't agree with everything in this manifesto. I don't necessarily agree with most of it. 
but the idea that the process is the product and that constraints sharpen the perspective on the process and stimulate play, stimulate play within limitations speaks to me. And then, basically paraphrasing this quote, a great game grows naturally, logically, and poetically out of all its conditions. Again, this is about constraints and about setting those constraints. So what is, what is this box? What is inside it and what defines it? Well, to us, and I'll get, I'll get back into this in a minute, but it can be, again, budgets, timelines, resources. It can be a pitch, a tagline, a customer promise, a vision statement. It can be the game pillars. It can be all of that. It's a way of crystallizing what your game is and discovering and building the boundaries early enough for your ideas to be grounded and to give you room to then experiment within those boundaries. There's a quote from that book on architecture that I really liked. It's draw the box it came in. And this is both the same and a different box. Actually, when we start out making a new game, we define the things that go on a potential physical box to begin with. We define the key art, we define the name of the game, we define the tagline, we define the Steam description, so the bullets on the back of the box. And again, that's such another layer to creating this box I'm speaking of. It's setting sort of the, the limitations of what the game is so that you can more easily create the game itself. We need to understand how the player sees our game to understand what it is. So the box is a way of thinking about the creative production processes from idea to product. Limiting freedom increases freedom and coloring within the lights. Lines means creativity within constraints which improves creativity. And of course, there are a lot of ways, again, like I said, you can, you can define a, a box. And this changes, this differs from me to you guys. For myself, when we start working on a game, and this is a lot of numbers, and I'm not going to mean anything to you guys, but as I cut out the most important stuff here. But I have two priorities when we make games. It's number one, of course, make great games, and the other to keep our studio running to keep people's jobs secure and to make sure we you know can continue making games for years to come so a lot of the process i start with is basically starting with spreadsheets and I'm, this is not does not come natural to me i'm a writer i'm a you know i i am a creative person so working with spreadsheets to me it's initially felt very unnatural but i've learned to embrace and love spreadsheets as the bedrock of, of being creative. So when I start thinking about a new project, a new game, I write the setting, I help define the core pillars, I sort of come up with a player experience, and then I set up a budget. And this is my box. This is how I know the constraints I have, how much time we have, the people we have, the different professions that we know we're going to be able to have working on the game, outsourcing, if any. And once that's set, it is so much easier to then go out and just focus on making the game. You have your box. So yeah, you can use budgets to build your box. You can use the people you have to define what the box is. You can use the time you have to define this box or the core pillars, vision statements, customer promise, anything that works for you, basically. And use this box at every stage in the process, from idea pitch, through design, and we talked about constraint, the conditional design, focus on the core pillar, on the vision statement, again, focus on the limitations you made for yourself. Same with development, working with iterations, working on constantly changing the game and how you make it and what you're making. And even launch. Launch is not the end. It's a new beginning. Again, sort of defining what you have to work with early on means you have a lot more freedom to do those things. 
I'm going to give a concrete example from one of the games we are working on now. So uh, Retro Games is working on two titles right now. One is called Svalbard, and I'm not going to be talking about that. The other is a game called Draugen. And Draugen is a first-person psychological horror story set in 1920s Norway. We use the word, the phrase Fjord Gothic to define what we're making, blending Nordic noir with Gothic suspense, Norse mythology, and cosmic horror. Our tagline is, I am not alone. You explore this deserted coastal village in the company of a mysterious young woman and uncover the horrifying secrets of this village. And what we call our customer promise is at the bottom. What this is, is basically, this is a promise we make to our players about what the game is and what they will experience. And it's important for us to stick with that. And that line is, you won't believe your eyes. So these things combined with the budget we know we have for the game is the box within we can create a Draugen. And these limitations, these constraints are very comforting and very good to have because again, it gives us freedom to do anything else we want to do within these lines. And for Draugen, we are of course constrained by our budget. We are constrained by the skill set of the team. We're constrained by the genre we have chosen, the game direction and target audience, and by the themes and setting that we have defined. What we're really not that constrained on, on this game is time, allowing for multiple iterations to let the game grow. And the game has changed so much from when we started working on it until today. Partly because of you know, having the time to do it right, but also because, again, we have this overall idea of the framework, but we are always and constantly willing to change what we do within that framework. I'll show you guys a little bit of a, a working prototype of Dragon. So this is actually right now, Fabulous. this is over a year old. Menacing. Might be more oh, than no. that. And at this time, we had focused on one of the most important things for us, which was the, the setting. And this game takes place in, in Norway in 1923. And it's a very specific mood we're going for. If you've ever been to Western Norway, uh, you know that weather, wind, um, landscape, all of these are very, very critical. It has to feel right. And it was very important for us to be able to recreate that. That was part of the box we defined, this setting. This setting had to feel completely right. So we began with that. And we began with some of the core ideas of the user interface, the way you navigate in the game, the story we're trying to tell. But as we made this prototype, we also realized that there were things here that were not as engaging as we wanted. So, you know, it's, this, is a, this is a psychological horror game. It's not a jump scare game. This is a game that is about story, about mood. Um, and it's really not a game that's heavy with game mechanics. There's no combat. There are very few systems. Uh, but we've also seen a lot of games coming out that are mood pieces, that are exploration type games. And some of them are really, really good. And in the few years that have passed since we sort of started working on this game, we also see that we can no longer support what we're trying to do with basically just exploration and just navigating through the world and, and finding and discovering the story. We needed more. So we kept sort of trying to find what are the unique gems, what are the elements that we want to use in order to tell the story and get players engaged with the story. So one of the things we have is the user interface and how that's tied to the main character's psyche and mental state. Another is the use of eyeglasses in the game, and you'll see that in a second, how uh, removing your glasses opens up a new world, basically. And again, this is about 
having this framework, this, this box, this defined idea of what the game is, but within that, not being too concerned with having basically written a big design and saying, this is the game we're going to make, but let that emerge over time, through iterations, through processes, through playing the game, through showing the game and having people's reaction to it. That's a rune stone from the Viking Age. And over time, like something else what emerged. And like I said, this is quite old. And the game we have today is really not about you being on your own and exploring this place. It is about you and other characters. And if we had focused on, again, being product driven, of saying, we have defined what the game is going to be, and that game is over there in the distance, and we're just going to run in order to get there. Is anyone there? Then we would not have made the game we're making today. We would have probably made a worse game. We made a game that would have been very rigidly defined from the get-go, and that would not Hello? have the benefit Hello? of change. Is anyone here? So I'm going to leave that. I'm not showing any spoilers. Um, so, we post a problem or a question at the beginning of this. How to make the right design and development decisions and ship a great game on time and on budget with the resources you have without crashing and burning. And what we have come to and how we try to solve that is right here. Again, let the process define and become the product. Again, limitations, how they encourage creativity, especially when you're a small studio, especially when you have very limited resources. You know, we don't have 100 people. We have, on this game we just showed, we have six people working on it. And those limitations can be a benefit. The budget limitations can be a benefit. The promise you're making to your players can be a benefit. And lastly, plans are worthless, planning is everything. Being willing to throw things away, both things you've created and things you've decided, when it makes sense to do that. Planning ahead, but always being ready to change in case of emergency, in case of a better idea popping up, in case of your mindset changing, the market changing. So Tom will tell if we're doing this right, I don't know. Um, if not, we'll start again with the knowledge we've gained and hopefully eventually we'll, we'll get it right. So to bring it all around to this, I still buy the toilet paper for the office because you know I'm not gonna have all the other people doing it. And we still struggle with releasing our games on time and on budget, but at least now we're able to scope properly and to know and define the limitations of what we can do beforehand. So thinking inside the box has helped shape how we make games and hopefully for the better. So when it comes to this, and I'm sure at least some of you came here to, to, to actually get this presentation, so I thought I'll bring it back to the beginning. I have a responsibility, it's printed in your programs. Maybe this is an answer. Game development is the iterative process of bringing ideas to the screen. So don't necessarily quote me on this, but I think it might be one way to look at game development. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Thank you, Ragnar. So are there any questions? No? If no one has a question, I have a question. So how many guys, of you guys are working on the game you want to play? That's good. I think that's really important. Now, one thing I didn't talk about here, actually, is that nobody should be working on a game that you don't want to play. And I know that, unfortunately, isn't always the case. But to me, that is such an important thing. That is the best way to make games, to be able to work on something where you're really looking forward to playing what you will have at the end of it. Any other questions? So first of all, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I would like to ask how difficult it is for you to get the right people to your team. That's a good question, but we don't actually look at it that way. This actually comes back to the idea of the box. I've said the box a lot in the last hour, I know. But 
rather than trying to get the right people, we have tried to get people we want to work with and then make the games that those people can make, if that makes sense. This comes back to the question I asked you guys, like, do you, do you, do you really want to play the game you're working on? And that's how we see ourselves. So we have a team of people, and we're not the best developers in the world, definitely not, but we work really well together. We have some really skilled people. We have people who are really good at certain things. And then we basically decide the game based on who those people are and what games they want to play. And that's how we do it. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for a great talk. Uh, as you say that uh, everyone should work on, on a uh, game uh, you want to play, uh, how much you want to play your game where you written the story <laughs> and you, of course, know the ending at the end? <laughs> No, no, but this is very true. Of course, at the end, you actually never want to play your game because you hate your game at the end of it. And every time you sit down and play it, you see all the things that you did wrong and you cringe and you have to turn things on and you often you have to do something completely different. There's no way, like, it's never fun to re actually play the game you make, right? Because it's, it's been years of, of seeing the same things over and over again. But the question isn't really, Afterwards, you want to play it, but beforehand, like, is this the game you would like to play? But I guess the real question is, is this a game you would want to play if you didn't have to make it? Because you ruin it by making it. Um, but, it but it is a very good point, yeah. The games are always ruined for us, and I, I pity the people who work on my favorite games. I feel like they never get the experience I get. I feel sorry for them. Hi. Thank Hello. you for the great talk. Uh, my question is uh, regarding Kickstarter uh, for Dreamfall chapters. How, when you decided to uh, end your work in Funcom, how big impact ac actually caused uh, f f the success of Kickstarter for your studio? I mean, it, it was something what you really like define uh, the future for your studio. Or did you have something like um, escape plan, like something something different in mind? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So it's it's never easy to start something when you don't have any money or really any experience doing doing that. So for Red Thread Games, the studio was actually started as a studio to make specifically make Dreamful chapters. So when I left Funcom, I had an agreement with them about because Funcom still owns the the IP, the license for the game. Um, so the agreement was, you know, I'll leave Funcom, and I, if you know, if I get to bring the rights with me in order to make this game then I can go and get some funding for that, and then we can go on Kickstarter. So all of it was dependent on making this game, which sounds sort of contradictory to the whole sort of idea of, of you know, make the game you want to play, because in this case, it felt more like this is the game we had to make. But it also happened to be a game I really wanted to make, so it made sense. But without Dreamful Chapters, and without the Kickstarter, and without the funding that came through all of that, there probably wouldn't be any Red Friend games. And also, we had a responsibility to make this game and finish it and give it to all our backers and you know, wrap up the story before we could even think about releasing something else. So this was always a studio that was built around this one game. And of course, things changed along the way, and it became from one game to five episodes. And, but all of it helped us really sort of build it helped us build more than just a game. It helped us build a company. It helped us build processes and pipelines and, and, and experience and being in a better place afterwards to make new games. So yeah, that's where we are. All right. Thank you very much, Ragnar. Thank again. you.